thought of writing a book? Do you ever say to yourself, what do I do if I want to write a book, but my life is boring? Well, sometimes you have to dig deep into your imagination. You have to ask yourself a question. Our next guest asked himself this question. Have you ever been angry enough to seek revenge? My name is Vin Aquino. Our next guest is Milton Lewis Steinberg, author of Drop of a Hat. Let's talk writing. Milt, good to see you. Vin, pleasure to see you. Ah, so, have you ever been angry enough to seek revenge? Well, Vin, <laughs> uh, I haven't been seeking revenge myself, but I sort of do it um, uh, secondhand. Ah, through, in this, uh, through your in this character. Writing. Yes. Now, this character came about from somewhere. Tell us a little bit about your background. You're a professor. Well, I was a professor. Okay. I'm Professor Emeritus All right. from Marymount College of Fordham University. I taught in the psychology department for hmm. 37 years wow. there. Um, I taught uh, neuroscience as well and uh, some computer courses and statistics. So in a sense, uh, it has uh, nothing to do with uh, a writing career. But I got an interesting question okay. the other day um, <laughs> when, uh, when I was doing a reading from this very book at the Brewster Library. A lovely woman asked me a question. She said, um, what made you think you could be a writer? <laughs> and I was trying to think of an answer to that question and finding it very difficult. And then suddenly I remembered an event that had happened uh, years ago and I hadn't thought of for years. I was a, um, a freshman in high school, took the standard English course, turned out to be a writing course. Teacher gave us an assignment. I go <laughs> home and write, bring the assignment in. The teacher says, did you write this? <laughs> yes, yes, I wrote this. She's skeptical. She says, come after school and write something for me. So I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, I'm quaking just a little bit. Uh, nobody likes to, to be disbelieved. Right. But I'm also thinking, gee whiz, this teacher thinks that what I wrote was so good that it couldn't have been written by somebody yeah, in this class. That's the ultimate compliment. So I came in after class and uh, I write something for her and I entitle it Integrity Test. <laughs> <laughs> she takes one look at the title and she decides it's the real deal. And that was the first time I think I thought I might be something like a writer. But you know, I went into psychology because I was interested in how the mind works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, so, and eventually became really interested in how the brain works and basically spent a 37 year career at, well actually if you include graduate school, more like a 45 year <laughs> career uh, studying this stuff and teaching this stuff. And I didn't really start writing until, um, uh, until I retired. Um, and then I, it's, it's hard to say what moved me in that direction, but you know, there were things in my life that happened and so on that sort of nagged me to write about them. Not specifically about, you know, specific events in my life, but sort of the thoughts and feelings that they yeah. brought up. I, I mean, I can understand that. The question I said before, you know, how do you write a book if your life is boring? Well, my life is not boring. No, but, <laughs> but, but the point I was trying to make to that student was the emotions, the feelings, the things that go on in the head are as important as the plot. You know, it's very important that you understand what motivates people, what makes people move, what makes them laugh, what makes them cry. You know, all very important. And as a psychologist, that is what you do. And you're in people's heads. Uh, your books fascinate me. I just absolutely love how it's a book about how people think as well as act. This book is amazing, 
here, here is a man, a mild-mannered professor, who all of a yeah. sudden, coincidence of course, who all of a sudden has his life completely changed in a, in a flash, in a flash. Tell us a little bit about this story. Where did this story come from? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Whenever you tell somebody that you wrote a novel, the first thing they say is, oh, what's, what's it about? Yeah. And uh, so I try to summarize the plot. It's about a, a man, a college professor, whose wife has been murdered. And he knows that the murderer, who is a powerful politician, is, is not going to be punished. So he's contemplating revenge. However, he, he's not equipped either physically or mentally or emotionally to extract revenge on anybody. He's a relatively sedentary yeah. person, like me. <laughs> and, um, and he doesn't have either the physical or emotional equipment. And yet he, he feels driven to extract revenge. And that's sort of the plot, but what I really want to tell people is that the book, as you were suggesting, is about emotions. It's about hu human emotions. I like to say it's about the poetry of human emotions. Um, it's about emotions that we have that we don't want to tell other people about because it's embarrassing. And it's about the emotions that we have that we don't tell ourselves about right, right. because it's unacceptable. So in, in many ways, uh, writing is therapy. It gives us a chance to get inside ourselves, find out who we really are, how we really feel about things. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been angry enough to seek revenge in the way your character sought revenge? No, but I've been pretty damn angry. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Uh, you know, I, I mean, one of the, uh, the major theme in this book is are we primarily rational beings or are we primarily emotional beings? What is it that really causes our behavior? Is it our rationality? Or is it our emotions? Now, for example, an example that I think many people would understand, you're driving on the highway and somebody does something that makes you angry. They cut you off. Mm -hmm. And I've had the experience of getting so angry, you know, gripping the steering wheel. I'm going to yeah. strangle yeah. the steering wheel. And, <laughs> and that's crazy. That's not rational. Um, and yet, here I am, a presumably rational person, chasing this guy down, and, and then I somehow get control of it and stop doing that, at least most of the time. Yep. But what is it that, that grabbed me? One of my theories that I actually live by is that much of what we do in a day is not action, it's reaction. It's how we react to everything around us, other people, other situations. In this case, this is really re reaction. Here is a person who really came out of himself and almost became someone else because of the situation. What about the resolution? While you were writing this book, did you know where he was going? No, I didn't, actually. It... it uh... And I actually can't tell you how it came to me. You know, the last chapters where, well, I, I sort of had a general idea of, uh, is he actually going to seek revenge? Is it going to be a successful attempt? And I had this general idea. But then some of it just sort of evolved in the, in the process of the writing. And I can't really explain how that happens. Okay, let us talk about the process of writing for you. First of all, where do you write? Um, well, I, I have a, a sort of an attic room 
okay. right now. That's, that's my little man cave, <laughs> yeah. as we sometimes call these yeah. things. I have my little man cave, too. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's where I, I'm writing. And I write in front of my computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I pace back and forth between sentences and... Beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of the day? It's never any particular time, okay. never any particular day. It's sort of when it moves me. Yeah. You know, it's different for each writer. Absolutely. Some writers, you know, write religiously every morning from 8 to 10 or night. I, I write middle of the night. Uh, it's a nice quiet time. Phone doesn't ring. There's not a million other things I could be doing at 3 o'clock in the morning. So I write. Uh, I also have my little man cave where I have everything there where I want it to be. Uh, filing cabinets, bookcases, it took me a long time to reach that point. A long time. But it makes life a lot easier. Uh, blocks of time. Do you block out a certain time? Are you there three hours, two hours, one hour, 15 minutes? Actually, I don't. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been told many times <laughs> that blah, blah, writers write, and if you're not writing every day, you're not a writer. By that criterion, I've got a problem because I don't write every day. I write when it moves me. Okay. Did this character write this book? No. I've, I've heard that many times, yep. too. The character didn't write the book. I had an idea about the whole thing, but it is an organic, it's an organic process, and you, you and the book dialogue in some way yep. that I can't really I, understand. Yeah. I, I definitely feel that. When I, yeah. I write both, nonfiction and fiction. You know, I do a lot of historical investigation, but I also do fiction. Fiction for me is the stroll in the park. It's that escape from everyday life. When I get into fiction, I get into fiction. And the characters do write the book for me. You know, I get in there and sometimes I sit eight, nine hours at the computer. And I just go. But then there I reach a point where it's like, done. And then I go to nonfiction again or I go to no writing. There's times when I go month, two months without any writing at all. Uh, but when I'm on a binge, I'm on a binge. Did this happen? How long did it take you to write this book? It's really hard to say because, you know, I wrote a piece here and then yeah. some time would pass and I wrote a piece here. It's, it's years. Right. And um, you bounce it off. I know you're part of our writing workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, you bounce it off of other people? You read set pieces or you don't? Some um, yes, some no? Or? In the writing workshop, I do. Right. But, but nowhere else. But nowhere else. So no. you don't, you know, like stop the mailman and say, hey, we nope. didn't hear this chapter I nope. just did. Not the mailman, not, How about your not wife? my wife. No? No. No? No. You do it in the workshop, but only in the workshop. What about reading it to yourself? I mean, there's many people who say that the hardest part of writing is rewriting. It's the revision. It's the polishing. It's the going back. Do your chapters come out whole, or do you have to really work those pieces? Well, it really depends. Uh, it's different every time. Okay. What I find is uh, I have to refine the language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I'll write something, it'll come pouring out, and then I go back and look at it, and, well, that was not entirely understandable. I have to insert words, remove words, move words around. And, and again, it, it's... You can't, it's hard to write a book about it. It, it, it's, um, it just sort of happens. I, yeah. For me, I feel as if I know when the words are right. And, and one of the joys of writing for me is, is the words. I, I think of it as a kind of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, one of my idols, exquisite writer, just passed recently, Ray Bradbury wonderful writer. I remember clearly one of the things he said that someone said to him, Mr. Bradbury, how do you know when the book is done? He said, well, when I can read it from the first page to the last without making any changes, it's done. And I thought to myself, is that even possible? 
<laughs> when you get to the end of the book, are you done? I reread the manuscript many, many times. Yeah. And every time I read it, I reread it, I found errors. Yeah. And I found things that needed to be changed. Yeah. And you do have to come to an end eventually. Right. And you have to just say, you know, But you know, the, the proof copy came in mm -hmm. and I went over it, my wife went over it, who happens to be a, an excellent editor. And we f kept finding mistakes, <laughs> yeah, we corrected the mistakes. Okay, so now I can't stand it anymore. It's time to, for the book to be published. The book comes back published. I, I find mistakes. myself reading it again, <laughs> and I'm still finding <clears throat> some mistakes, but I'm only finding one or two. Yeah. And I figured, look, it, it's got to stop sometimes. Now, there is one thing that I, it was a revelation for me. The understanding that when you start a book, for the first time, and you write that first page, it's completely different. But you're in a different place after you write the last page because now you know things you didn't know when you wrote that first page. So do you find yourself going back and saying, whoa, that can't be right because of this and here. Do you find yourself rewriting from a whole different point of view after you're done with the first draft? Th that, that didn't really happen extensively with this book. Because you do it each. Yeah, chapter. but it, but it's happening with the book that I'm working on now. Speaking of the book you're working <laughs> on now, I absolutely love the premise of the new book you're working on. Uh, I'll let you tell it, but I love the idea of what you're doing. Now, the book's not done. No, but it's definitely not done. <laughs> but you're into it. Tell us a little bit about the brand new book. I don't even think it has a, it only has a working title. It has, has a working title. It's called uh, Three Fifths of a Man. Three Fifths at, of a Man. At this okay. point. Um, the, the book takes place in the near future, so it's a little bit of a science fiction deal. And uh, it's about a woman who is dying of cancer that's okay. attacked her entire body. And uh, she is saved by a transplant. Her brain is transplanted into a healthy body. So her body's dead, but her brain's very her much alive. Her brain is very much alive. Okay because the nervous system is protected in various ways, stretching the truth a little bit <laughs> here, her brain is, is not affected by this cancer. So her brain is healthy. So now they're going to have to find the exact opposite. Well, what they, ideally they would find a body that matched her current body, but it's not so easy to find someone whose brain dead, but whose body is very much alive, and whose family agrees that they can do this. So it's very difficult to find uh, the, the body. When they do, it turns out to be the body of a large black male. Wow. She is a small white female. Wow, so now her brain is going to go into the body of this man, and now she's going to have to deal with this whole new body and this whole new family. This family is going to look at this body and see their father. But it's really going to be this woman. So tell me more about, so what happens? She wakes up, looks in the mirror, and oh my God, it's not this little woman. Yeah, well, the, the, there are a couple of interesting premises going on. One is the question of whether or not we are primarily our minds mm -hmm. or, or, our or our bodies. And um, to ourselves, we're not looking at ourselves all the time. To ourselves, we're primarily our minds. But how about the people around us, our family, yeah. our friends? 
to them were primarily our bodies. And if we look like a stranger and talk like a stranger with the, with the, the, the voice quality of a stranger, then how will our family and friends react to us? So that's one of the things going on in the book. Another thing going on it has to do with uh, racial prejudice. Yeah. Uh, because in this particular near future time, it's still a factor in our society. Um, so, and another theme is being the other, coping with suddenly being the other, yeah. being male instead of female, being black instead of white. Now, interestingly, what brought up my wanting to talk about this book was your comment about whether or not you have to go back and <laughs> yeah. rearrange the front when you get to the back. <laughs> And I, I've actually laid off the writing for quite a while because I was wrestling with an ending. And perhaps the audience would be interested in that process. Um, nothing, it wasn't really happening for me. And I couldn't seem to proceed without that. I knew that the book had an interesting premise. And I knew that the whole business of you know, coping with the new sexuality, coping with the new uh, race was, was compelling, but I wasn't sure where to go with it. And, you know, there are various possibilities. You know, one possibility is that you, you turn it into a, a superhero kind of thing or a James Bond kind of thing where they're shooting guns and, and, and that didn't seem like the way I wanted to go in particular. So I was struggling with um, how am I going to bring all of this together and make it meaningful so that her sex, her, her femaleness, is somehow going to have uh, an effect in this story. Uh, and really just a very short time ago, I, I came up with something. Okay. So I'm sort of like back at it. Yeah. But now I've got to go back to the beginning and I've got to do some rewriting so that what I'm talking about at the end is going to match the beginning. Right. So exactly what you so were describing. So is it coming together? Is it it's coming together. It's, it's, still, it's, still, still, it's still hard. Yeah, some glitches. Yeah. I could imagine because you're talking about this balance between the social aspect and the psychological aspect and ethics. I mean, there's so many things in play here. This is a psychologist book to me. I mean, this is, this is not about what happens, but emotionally what happens. And you're really one step above here. Uh, I love what you're doing with it so far. Uh, it's just fascinating to me. I can't wait to get to the end. Do you see an end? I'm, I'm beginning to see an end. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. Yes. Right. I, I'm, I'm seeing that it's not bang, bang, shoot him up. Right. And that it's going to have to do with emotional responses, her female emotional responses, which are being thwarted by her present circumstances. Let me ask you a question now. Now your head is there. This happens to me a lot. I've written many books now. And people say to me, how do you let go of the other one to go to the new one? Were you able to let go of this book? Is it done, out of your head? It's done. I, I had done. no problem with it. And that's done. It's like yeah. sending your boy to school. Yeah, He's off to college. Done. Whatever he does out there, he does. So now you're in her head, and now this is where you're concentrating. Right. No, this is, this is absolutely done. I, I know that uh, some people who read this book, when they found out I was doing another book, they said, oh, is it going to be a sequel? And I said, yes, no, no, absolutely no. not. But you do talks. You go to various places to 
uh, talk about this. Book. Oh yeah, that's fun. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> I, I enjoy that. That's fun, and this so is so you fun. do autograph sessions, and you go to libraries and anywhere they're willing to listen while you're doing this other work. How much time are you putting into this new book? Um, lately, I've just been putting in head time. Okay. Uh, when I get yeah. back at yeah. it, I'll put in more time. Yeah. Many people don't realize that writing is in all ways writing. Writing is thinking, mulling over the ideas, the thoughts, giving that character a chance to breathe a little. Uh, you need that space. I've literally been doing things like uh, reading the newspaper to see if I come up with ideas for this right. ending. I've talked to people and said, what, uh, what ideas do you have for this ending? Um, it's it's a, a fun struggle. I hear you. Well, we, I, can't wait to find out how this book ends up. You have me by the throat in, with this book. I love this book, but I absolutely adore the new one. I can't wait to see the rest of it. And we can't wait to read your books. I am pleased that you've gone to the writing end of writing. Uh, I'm sure you enjoy teaching. I know you still are doing some teaching. Uh, keep writing. Let us keep reading your books. And the next time we come, we're going to be here to listen to a teacher who has some very interesting ideas. What if you, your job was to teach Shakespeare to 17-year-olds? They didn't want to hear it. What if you decided to create rap songs out of Shakespeare? Until then, it is absolutely a pleasure to have worked with you, to hear you today, to read your work. Keep up the good work. Let it keep happening. Uh, I appreciate all you're doing. Um, any final thoughts? Um, hmm, final thoughts. Well, I guess... Um, writers should? Writers should. Writers should write. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And read. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. It was absolutely a pleasure to have you here. Um, and... Uh,